Midnight Oil, Forgotten Years. You're with Lorix Live on Anonymous Radio. Time for our first guest. Sorry, just having a little chuckle there, watching the Twitter feed go ballistic between Anonymous and Asher Wolf at the moment. Uh, that's all I've got to say about that. Time for our very special friend, Sam Castro. As a friend of the show, has been a lifelong activist defending the environment and fighting for a better future for her three children and others who share the planet. She works for Friends of the Earth Australia, which was uh, declared an extremist organisation for its campaigns against coal and uranium mining companies. Sam uh, was also active in in Make Poverty History campaign and Occupy Melbourne, where a violent eviction resulted in a lawsuit against the police. In 2010, she co-founded WikiLeaks Australian Citizens Alliance, or WACA, which is the oldest Assange WikiLeaks support group in Australia. One of the terrible realities we hear time and time again on the show is that anyone who speaks the truth to power is classified as a threat. And one of the greatest threats uh, at the moment is WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Never one to shy away from the controversial issues issues uh, in pursuit of truth, Sam expanded her efforts to support Julian's bid for Australia's Senate and formation of the WikiLeaks party. We all agree that transparent and accountable government is the foundation of democracy, but the process of formalising uh, that is messier than just embracing the truth. We're delighted to have Sam with us to talk about the evolution of the political reform efforts in Australia, the recent election last week, the challenges and opportunities going forward. And uh, as always, if you tweet to me, Lorex Live on Twitter, any questions you want to ask Sam, we'll try and uh, get them to her. Welcome to the show, Sam. Can you hear me all right there? Uh, yeah, I can hear you fine. Thanks, good Lorex. Look, good to have you back on the show. Can we start by explaining to the audience how the WikiLeaks party began? What was the motivation to transition from a support group to a political one, and in what way were the aims of WACA and the WikiLeaks party similar? Uh, well, I guess the the grassroots movement in support of Julian and, and the work of WikiLeaks and also Bradley Manning and, and others fighting to speak truth to power has been going on in this country, as you mentioned, since uh, 2010. And, and for people like myself, my academic background is in uh, global media and the war on terror so been going on for a lot longer than that for me. Uh, so I, I think that the WikiLeaks party was a, a natural response to the growing uh, political activist movement in Australia uh, that was really seeing that both sides of politics were uh, you know sort of veering to this centric right position and really uh, dropping the humanist values that that we're all searching for through the the truth and transparency movement so that was the original uh, reason that there was enough groundswell movement to consider entering into the political realm with Julian in the Senate yeah yeah for sure we uh, anyone in Australia knows what happened in the election with the Liberal Party pretty mm. much winning by a landslide last week but we'll get on to WikiLeaks and how it done once it, once it was agreed that a proactive political effort was needed and the WikiLeaks party was formally established how was the organization structured was it was it a traditional campaign model or, or did you take a, a more novel approach well uh, you know I think originally when the idea was put forward to myself and Kaz Cochran as founders of WACA last year uh, our suggestion was that Julian run as an independent mm. uh, and that the grassroots movement be allowed to just continue to do their work to support him yeah. and that we present that as a very honest reflection to the community about it being a protest vote about the Australian government's abandonment of an Australian citizen. Uh, the formation of the party really came about uh, from the push and impetus of Julian's father, John Shipton, yeah. uh, who really you know, put to us that uh, a political vehicle was necessary uh, because obviously Julian's in a very difficult circumstance in terms of being able to take up his Senate seat and, and to give real political voice to the people within the movement. So that's how it was presented. Uh, it was always going to be a campaign due to Julian's confinement that would be using social media and technology to communicate with people, which is effectively what we did yeah. throughout the campaign. Uh, so when it was set up, it, it was set up as a as a democratic structure with a 11 person governing body. Mm -hmm. Each person has one vote and that was to be the body that would make the original choices uh, under the constitution uh, to protect Julian in some respect until next year when it would be opened up to membership voting. Yeah, so, so I read about some um some problems there with the preferences in, in internal politics there, I suppose you could call it. Uh, when did these problems first begin? Were there, what were the issues with the group voting tickets that become 
you know, so large they could not be resolved amongst uh, the internal group? Yeah, well, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, I guess it began sort of in the month prior to having to submit the ballot papers where we began serious discussion as a governing body uh, along with the campaign director, Greg Barnes, uh, around preference deals. Mm. And, of course, it, it, it intensified as we got closer to the group voting ticket being submitted. Yeah. Uh, look, there was, there was a sense of... I think there was confusion in some respect... Uh, not by members of the council, but in fact by uh, perhaps Julian being at a distance and, and Greg Barnes uh, as a right-leaning libertarian uh, around w what our actual base support was in yeah, this country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, you know, we entered into really strong debate and discussion around that. Uh, we solicited expert advice from, um, I guess you would call him uh, a, a full-time preference expert in this country, Charles Richardson. Yep. He's, uh, who, uh, he's got a lot of press lately, hasn't he, about some other, other senators and their uh, situation? Yeah, oh, I'm not sure if you're confusing him with oh. Glenn Jury. Okay, yeah, um, sorry, yeah, I am. Yeah, Glenn yeah. Jury is the sort of right-wing micro-party uh, preference whisperer yeah. Uh, yeah. who was certainly in, in hot pursuit of the WikiLeaks party uh, to join his little cabal. Yeah. Uh, so, look, the expert advice and our personal understanding of the supporter base in this country was leading to some really heavy discussions around, uh, you know, this idea of trying to present ourselves as neither left or right, when really, you know, the true purpose of the party was to be neither left or right once in power in terms of oversight. Mm. Uh, and, and by some within the party, there was an absolute failure to recognise that, you know, regardless of, of where you sit on the political fence, those in this country that were offering their support and their votes were really coming from either people that had never been involved in politics before, uh, people that were bleeding from, from the Labor Party or the Greens Party, yeah. and very, very few from the right side of the political spectrum. So um, the preference deals, you know, were discussed we had to uh, make our final decision the night before the tickets were due and we had many, many meetings that day, uh, robust debate and discussion, and we agreed the majority of the council bar uh, three votes, one of those being a proxy vote by, uh, for Julian, held by Julian's father. Uh, the council agreed that we would put the right wing, uh, far, the far right wing parties uh, below the Greens. and. You know, I, I think that that was a sensible choice considering the base support. Yeah. Uh, so then we woke up the next morning and everything was, of course, upside down and back to front in New South Wales and, and WA. Uh, so there's some misperception out there that somehow uh, the four national council members, including myself, uh, Leslie Cannell, Julian's running mate in Victoria, the entire campaign and volunteer team in WA and Victoria, there's, there's this misperception that we resigned because, uh, you know, we spat the dummy because we didn't get our way. Uh, but really what, what happened was the uh, directive of the National Council was subverted. And not only was it subverted, but there were clear uh, intent, in particularly by the secretary of the party, who is John Shipton, uh, to, con to then cover that up and continue to subvert the democratic po process within the council. Uh, so, you know, just to make it really clear to everybody, if we had decided to uh, preference the far right and the council had voted for that, I would have simply come out and said, well, I didn't vote for that, but I accept the democratic process. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, that's not what occurred. Uh, what occurred was subversion and then a cover up, which continues to this day. So that was the reason that we actually had to resign, because it became quite clear uh, that the party had been set up with a democratic structure, had pulled in people that were actually committed to the movement and the values, and then was expecting us to act as frauds, as the public face. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was impossible uh, for us to do to not only our supporters in Australia, but to everybody around the world who was watching on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I suppose one of the big problems too was uh, time, you know, I mean, I mean, trying to establish uh, a party from uh, ground up, you know, uh, 
you know, takes a lot of effort, you know, a great deal of time and effort was invested into WikiLeaks you know, party in addition to an enormous emotional commitment with hopes you know, for major change in the political status quo. Um, mm. And I suppose that was always going to be a big hurdle to overcome, trying to establish a party from the ground up. Uh, just look at the Labor Party at the moment. They've changed the rules leading up to the election, and now they don't know what to do. And this is a you know, a party with a long, a long-running uh, sort of you know, time frame and a well-established party. So, so I suppose most people wouldn't understand those deals that are been going on. I got a question here from Whistleblowing Rake. He said, "Did Greg Barnes bring a typical?" Political advisor ethos to the WikiLeaks party, in, uh, for example, where did you know was there residuals from previous political work he'd done? Well, you know, uh, uh, Greg Barnes is a is a complicated uh, individual. Uh, some people, especially your overseas listeners, may not know he was a Liberal Party advisor to the Howard government. Mm. He was also disendorsed from the party for uh, criticising their refugee policy. Uh, he then went on to uh, uh, advise and work with the Democrats and, you know, seemed to have had a hand in unravelling that as well. Uh, I think Greg Barnes uh, certainly uh, brought uh, a, a particular old school uh, mentality to how you interact with people within a campaign team. Yep. And I think he demonstrated repeatedly uh, in private to myself and Kaz Cochran, who were the main campaign managers, uh, his dislike uh, for the Greens and also his dislike for Scott Ludlam. Mm. So there were certainly biases there that we were continually uh, trying to fight against and, and balance out. Yeah, and I suppose that would have carried across the, the country once you start uh, involving yeah, other people, especially in fringe politics, you start to get a mix of ideas and without that time frame uh, being available to... Uh, debate those mix of ideas, I suppose, it can cause uh, problems in that respect. Like, did you see positive effects of the WikiLeaks party campaign in the final outcomes of the election? What were the, what, what were the final numbers? Did the, and also, did the learning process produce any ideas or plans to pursue political reforms going forward? We still need major political changes. Are, are we any better prepared to tackle that challenge in the future? Look, I, I mean, uh, as you know, I've resigned from the party and the yeah. council, uh, so I can't speak for the lessons they've learned. And the fact that they haven't conducted a independent review over what took place with the failure to follow the council's directives is incredibly disturbing. And, and the lies that they've spun since suggest to me that they've learned nothing. Yeah. Uh, but from my perspective and from uh, the the support network and, and the movement's perspective, particularly around WACA, we learnt some incredibly valuable lessons. And I hope that, if nothing else, the party has realised that as much as they would like to position themselves as being neither left or right, which I think is incredibly important if you are actually in the Senate and acting in a role of oversight, mm. in, in terms of their base support, you know, they, they barely scraped, uh, I mean, they, they got basically, you know, nothing in WA and very little in New South Wales and less, you know, 1.19% in Victoria. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, th I hope the lesson that they've learned is as much as they would like to position themselves in this um, neutral space, clearly the support movement, uh, whether you're a disenfranchised or dis disillusioned left-leaning person or whether you're someone like me who simply thinks that we've lost touch with our humanist values, uh, they clearly misread their base yeah. and their behaviour around uh, preferences and then uh, subsequent attacks on, their, on, on people like myself over um, resigning has clearly demonstrated that progressive voters in this country will not tolerate uh, someone, a, a party like the WikiLeaks party, claiming to walk the talk around transparency, accountability and justice, uh, preferencing Australian Nazis. Mm. Uh, I mean, this is just insanity uh, and, and disconnect. So the lessons that we have taken away as an activist and campaign community uh, it's been very clarifying for us we've we've really learned that we uh, if we are going to change the body politic 
and the structure of politics in this country, we need to have a very strong, robust movement. And at the moment, it is a fledgling movement, yep. uh, albeit a, a global one. And, and secondly, that we have to be prepared uh, to stop accepting these platitudes of, oh, well, that's politics. Actually, that's how we've ended up in this state of global fascism, by saying, oh, well, that's just how it is. What did you expect? Uh, I think we really need to learn to walk the talk, uh, both in political parties, but also as people involved in uh, a movement that is fighting for these values. It's not okay to say you're committed to these values and then ignore autocratic behaviour, sexism or uh, political subversion. Uh, you're, you're only replicating uh, the same paradigm and the same old school politics that has led to the disgraceful state of politics in this country and around Western democracies. Yeah, yeah, no, I have to agree with you 100% there. Look, what do you, what do you see going forward in terms of formal and informal political reform? You know, we're talking about mm -hmm. WikiLeaks, so obviously I, I, I hope I'm right to assume you're still involved with WikiLeaks as such, uh, just not the party. You know, is WikiLeaks standing as a journalist entity you know, still, and, and Julian's asylum bid is still a criti is critical and a defining issue to measure where our politicians stand. So, so what, what, what's, what's, what's in store for us going forward with WikiLeaks there? Mm. Well, uh, you know, I think what's been going on in America this week uh, with the Assange clause in terms of trying to uh, place uh, any whistleblowing publishing entity outside of the realm of journalism is extraordinary yep. and, and should, it should be of deep concern to us as a global citizenry uh, and particularly as Australians because it, obviously you know it, it's it's completely directed at, at Julian which suggests the the pursuit of uh, Julian Assange by the uh, US administration is far from over mm. so I think that this is really critical to understand uh, Wacker of course uh, continues to uh, support the work of WikiLeaks. It's invaluable. Uh, I would like to see the community expand. Uh, we we would like to see uh, focus on not only uh, others that are in similar positions to Julian without such high profile, but also really tackling the source issues. So, you know, those, those kind of issues really require us to connect the dots. Uh, and to then be prepared to tackle it at the source. So, for example, uh, in Australia, uh, Telstra signed a deal with the FBI back in 2001 after 9-11 uh, to effectively hand over and use their cables in the sea under seabed uh, to spy on people. Yeah. So, you know, I would like to see the Australian community and, and WACA is certainly interested in tackling the very real issue of uh, addressing Telstra's behaviour and encouraging people to divest from their shares, incurring superannuation funds to divest from Telstra, uh, actually mounting campaigns that say this is unacceptable and we want change rather than um, simply talking about the broader issues. And of course the problem, you know, both in, in politics and in um, the activist community is, you know, much like Chris Hedges uh, suggests in Death of, of the Liberal Class, we have the co-option of uh, institutionalised NGOs that apparently are fighting for our rights but do very little. Uh, because they're they're tied to government funding, yeah. so there are many many components of this that are still unraveling and still need addressing. Uh, in terms of building the political body and a new body politic in this country, there are people that do understand that and do want that to occur. the The issue is uh, how do how do we achieve that? Uh, at the moment when it looks like we are going to have a Tony Abbott government that, that may have control of both houses. Yeah. So once again, it's reflective of progressive and left-leaning campaigns always fracturing and always uh, sort of fighting amongst themselves. Uh, n now we need to get over that and, and recognise that uh, the only way that we can truly tackle uh, this body politic is if we are united in our efforts. So uh, that's what I would like to see uh, come out of this so that we can build a strong movement for the body politic. And I, and I think that uh, the attempt of the WikiLeaks party demonstrated that very much the bulk of the population don't give a shit 
so you know what do we do we need we, we need to actually look at direct action we need to look at the tactics and the tools that we use and we need to go to the source and understand that you know the the fossil fuel wars going on across this planet are completely interconnected to the military industrial complex which is connected into the corporate multinational global um, component that that is allowing people to spy on us strip us of our civil rights destroy indigenous land uh, these things are all interconnected and as long as we keep remaining in our silos and pretending that they're not it's going to be very very hard to bring about effective legislative or behavior change well yeah almost impossible important point i think you brought up there we about telstra too i mean telstra's we have we are we do have privacy laws in this country that uh, are mm. meant to protect us and uh, Telstra has broken that law time and time again yet never seems to come under any government scrutiny um, mm. regarding those issues so I think that, that's something that worries me uh, quite a lot so but I do think uh, it has become more prevalent especially since the uh, Snowden leaks I mean we saw on uh, this week Gary O'Brien uh, what's his show uh, Four Corners doing this mm. show about uh, about the privacy situation so i do think the uh, mums and pops and families out there are starting to take more notice um and it's uh, that's why i think an important point you bring up about telstra we need to uh make these organizations more accountable and you, you're quite right direct action uh, needs to be taken and we need to make the government accountable for not following up on its own uh its own laws basically that are meant to protect us Look, also this week we've got uh, alexa o'brien another friend of the show who will be in australia for a forum on whistleblowers uh, is this an indicator of a, a shift to a more global focus on the issues we face in addition to her historic role as the official record keeper for the manning trial um do you think uh, this paints a picture of how uh, people are starting to realize that th th this is a global issue not just uh, a local geo location issue yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, look, we, we brought out earlier this year uh, Vincent Emanuele, who's with Iraq uh, Veterans Against the War. Uh, and the reason that we did that is, you know, we, we have massive problems with our military uh, uh, soldiers not, not wanting to speak out in this country. And we really think that it's time that we start hearing from the voices uh, around the globe and, and particularly in America, which is, you know, the belly of the beast yeah. uh, ar around these issues. And uh, Australians have been very well I integrated and connected into cyberspace. And those that are involved in the movement, of course, are aware of these kind of people. But we decided it's time to start bring, bringing them out here to speak about their experience within their own country, which, you know, let's face it, is behaving like a rogue nation on many many levels yeah. uh, so our our first our first attempt to do that was by bringing out Vince to uh, talk about his experience as an Iraq war veteran mm -hmm. uh, and what's going on in America you know which uh, anyone who wants to jump on the wacker side our solidarity page you can check out his uh, speeches when he was out here in Australia and it, it's really quite uh, frightening you know what's going on and what they're facing uh, Alexa is another example uh, Wacker has been connected uh, via uh, Twitter to Alexa since way back US Day of Rage and has followed her work and her growth uh, she's an extraordinary human being and and journalist and activist uh, and also US Day of Rage her org organization was also falsely listed as a terrorist organization <laughs> yeah, in America absolutely unbelievable so, isn't it it's extraordinary. So she'll be in Sydney doing two gigs in Sydney, uh, one at the Opera House and yep. then one with the support Assange and Wikileaks Coalition. And then she's heading down here to Melbourne, to Melbourne yep. for an event on the 20th. Now, the discussion that we're talking about is, you know, the war on whistleblowers and, and defending dissent from uh, Occupy to Manning. Yeah. So we think it's a really important discussion. Uh, her reflections both as a journalist and an activist uh, you know, considering the kind of pressure she's been under uh, are well worth hearing. And also, let's remember that she is also uh, part of the class action on yes. the NDAA. NDAA, that's right. Now, we've talked before, Lorax, about 
the, the extraordinary capacity for Americans to only pay attention when it affects them, mm. um, you know, because th this NDAA is, of course, uh, applicable to the global citizenry, uh, which is outrageous that they can take an unconstitutional domestic law and apply that to anyone on the globe. <laughs> and it's wonder it's wonderful that this group of amazing individuals are challenge it, challenging it. It's all always of course through the lens of how dare they do this to americans yeah. you know i would like to say to the global community how dare they do that to all of us and we should all be up in arms about uh you know the the indefinite detention of individuals such as ourselves who could be labeled as enemies of the united states so i'm really interested in in hearing uh, her perspective on that and and also learning some lessons as a grassroots community ab about organizing around these issues that somehow seem to be happening in America yet have implications for anyone who voices dissent on this planet. Yeah, you know? for sure. Somebody, What about getting someone like Andrew Wilkie in on that uh that situation as well, but him being a, a famous Australian whistleblower as well that was persecuted, obviously, there uh, over yeah. the Iran-Iraq war. Um, would he add any political clout, you might say, to these debates coming up? I, well, it's interesting you mention Andrew Wilkie because uh, we, of course, were, were watching uh, what happened to Andrew Wilkie uh, as a whistleblower mm. and, you know, it's quite devastating Um We've had our own small taste of that about coming out and talking the truth of the WikiLeaks party. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's quite devastating to see the way these people are, are, are smeared and, and their lives are destroyed. Andrew Wilkie, of course, wonderfully picked himself up and entered the political realm. Quite uh, but since then, too, I, you know, I have to be honest and say yeah. I'm really disappointed that he... Uh, well, I'm disappointed that, you know, the whistleblower legislation that, that got pushed through is, is has massive loopholes in it, is really ineffective. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it leaves out huge chunks of the public service. It doesn't mention anything about military personnel. There, there are massive problems with the whistleblower whistleblower legislation as it stands. And, of course, it's not, you know, it's not currently um, very effective. So... We, we have approached Andrew Wilkie several times over the last couple of years to lend his support and attend certain things, and he's always refused. Is that right? Uh, now, that's his prerogative. Yeah, yeah. that's his prerogative as, a, as an individual, and perhaps he was just busy. Yeah. Uh, but I've got to say, uh, you know, with all due respect to, to the massive step that he took to expose the Iraq war, uh, the falsehoods of that, which... Again, we are still the only country that hasn't had an inquiry yeah. into why we went to that illegal war. And, and that's something that really needs to be addressed in this country because, you know, if this Syria situation actually, uh, you know, blows back up again, uh, we are still a country where there is no requirement for a parliamentary vote to go to war. So, you know, there are massive problems in this country about waging war, how we choose to go to war, and also a lack of self-reflexive behaviour to actually uh, look at what went on and, and to actually hold accountable those who made those choices. So, uh, I'm a, uh, you know, I've got to say I'm a bit disappointed in Andrew Wilkie because he risks so much to expose that. And I haven't seen him follow up on the Iraq war inquiry. I haven't seen him challenge the whistleblower laws that, that have gone through. And he's certainly shown no interest in being involved in, in the fledgling movement here around these issues. So mm, such a shame. I, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to reach out to him again. And in yeah. fact, you know, I'll give that commitment that Wacker will reach out to him again. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, you know, so far it's not been very, um, very fruitful. No, such a shame. I did watch a good uh, documentary he was involved with about changing the uh, the law, the, what is it, the, the, the World War One law about uh, government employees uh, not being able to whistleblow or, or reveal any secrets. I thought he did a pretty good job on that. So that was a probably a little bit of a follow-up on... Uh, on, on his initial actions. Um, another person you probably want to speak to, I don't know if you know, Lee Bolger, the US um, President for Veterans for Peace. Do you know Lee? Uh, I, I know of Lee. Yeah. I, I don't know him personally. Her, uh, her. She's a great, uh, great lady and she's also looking to hook up with other veterans in Australia. Uh, talking about that point you made earlier about, uh, about trying to find uh, military personnel who might be wanting to uh, 
speak out. She might be an important uh, person to maybe get down here to help build a, another form of the movement there of military personnel who want to uh, speak out about you know, what they get involved in. I'm sure there's a few out there. Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, when we had Vincent Emanuele coming out, who I, I might also add is involved in Veterans for Peace as well as Iraq uh, uh, Veterans Against War, I was contacting a lot of the uh, support groups and veterans groups in this country to ask them to come along to, to hear Vince's story about mm. post-traumatic stress. And I spoke to uh, the Vietnam Veterans Group and I was quite flabbergasted at the response that I got, which uh, basically what was said to me is, oh, no, we're not political. We don't get involved in that political stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, I understand that there is a lot of pain and trauma and the first focus should, of course, be on uh, protecting and looking after people that have been, uh, for whatever reason, in these situations of, of war. Uh, and, and it's now proving that post-traumatic stress is actually intergenerational, uh, which is, you know, a huge uh, revelation for, you know, many children whose, whose parents... Uh, you know, from World War One to onwards, uh, have served in. But uh, you know, I, I've really found that for some reason, uh, it's very difficult to to get uh, military personnel to to want to be open about anything other than perhaps their you know problems with um, you know RSL or, or or something like that. And yeah, yeah, it would be nice to see that change because. You know, there is this perception, this mythical perception that somehow Australian soldiers are, you know, these grand individuals that, you know, certainly don't uh, participate in war crimes such as uh, has been openly revealed about American soldiers. Uh, and yet they have nothing, nothing to say, nothing to tell the community about the horrors of war. Uh, there's been a few brave, brave souls, uh, such as the gentleman who wrote Exit Wound, uh, who came out he was um he was in iraq you know and he talked about them you know bulldozing and, and covering up people that were still alive and yeah. and things like that and, and that was quite horrid uh but of course there's no follow-up on that there's no you know attempt to investigate wh why are we in bed with an ally that is participating in torture and war crimes using cluster munitions and white phosphorus and depleted uranium why do we continue to stand as an ally and chase them into war you know as their best mates when when this is the kind of behavior that's going on i find it very confusing as an individual uh and also as an activist yeah yeah for sure we've had brandon Neely on the show here to a former gitmo guard who uh, spoke uh, really candidly about David Hicks's uh, situation, which obviously we in Australia can't hear anything about David Hicks uh, from the mainstream media as he's been gagged. But uh, we, we got to hear about it here from uh, Brandon, who was actually one of the guards. So it was a real eye-opening experience. A couple of questions from uh, some of the listeners. Uh, Francisco Castro wants to know about what about Julian Assange's accountability for his support base. We haven't talked about that much uh, on this chat. Uh, how, how much involvement did Julian have in this uh, situation with the WikiLeaks party before you resigned? <sighs> <laughs> well, you know, look, Julian has made various statements since we resigned, which are in fact insulting and hurtful for someone who, you know, for a group that has supported him so strongly. Mm. Uh, so one of the things he implied repeatedly was that we were... Um, a front for the Greens, which is absolute rubbish. He also went out and reinforced uh, the spin around the selection in WA of uh, the Aboriginal David Wirrapundur as a, a, a you know an Aboriginal man. Yeah. Which, uh, to be perfectly honest, I found completely insulting to the Indigenous community. That that kind of paternalistic tokenism is you know I, I thought would have been beyond an, uh, beyond him. Uh, and it was untrue. That was not. That was not the agreement. Uh, so you know, look, I, it's very difficult to say how much Julian was was aware, uh, because he is obviously isolated. Uh, he's refused to contact me. We've we've had one email exchange uh, in the last three days uh, where he said he was uh, now open to talking, and yet he uh, has not. Uh, responded to my request for a, a time and mm -hmm. method. Yeah. 
Uh, in terms of what went on in New South Wales, and, uh, you know, there is evidence to suggest that this was clear subversion of the National Council Directive. And what, what I can say to you is that I don't believe the people that were involved in that would have behaved in that way without the tacit approval of Julian. Uh, I have no evidence to suggest that he uh, was involved in the actual GVT ticket, uh, but I find it very hard to believe that they would have behaved that way uh, without him being aware of it. Yeah. Uh, and I would like Julian to come clean on what he did know. I mean, he's he's gone out, you know, you may have seen the piece on the drum, declaring himself to be the president of the party. Well, there is no president position. We have a chair, and that chair is Cassie Finlay, and she has gone to ground. Uh, so, you know, there is a lot to be uncovered and investigated, and that includes Julian, because he could have set the party up as an autocratic structure. Instead, he chose a democratic structure and then openly tried to subvert those processes, uh, you know, within the council. And that email that was... Um, sent out leaked to crikey uh clearly stated you know that what he wanted us to do was enable the candidates to decide the preferences for him to veto anything he didn't like mm. and for the council to rubber stamp that now i understand julian can adopt such an autocratic position within wikileaks because that's his organization uh, but this party was supposed to belong to the supporters and the members. Yeah. And that kind of behaviour was really a massive warning sign for us uh, that either Julian has been institutionalised himself or is so far removed from the ground that he failed to recognise his own behaviour was a subversion of his party's process. Yeah, interesting point you make there. Um, I'd, I'd have to believe myself that uh, being locked up like he has been would remove him uh, and cause problems with perception um, psychologically. It's been how long now? Oh, it's well, it's been well over a year in, in the uh, Ecuadorian embassy and, you know, he's really been under house arrest since since late 2010. And, and even, you know, in look, that, even in that situation, though, you'd have to wonder because he doesn't, uh, I know in psychological senses, uh, jail... Uh, prisons set up in Western civilizations give uh, prisoners a form of routine to keep uh, for certain reasons psychologically. Julian yeah. doesn't even have that in his situation. He has uh, basically his own routine. He has to try and commit to, with, you know, with, by being locked in that uh, in that building. So, yeah, uh, probably something that uh, psychologically wise, I would uh, consider has has to have some effect. You know. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, please don't get me wrong. I, you, you know, I fully support Julian's rights as a human being. Uh, I do believe he is being uh, unfairly pursued by the US. Uh, everything that WACA stands for around Julian's freedom, we still stand for. Uh, I have a lot of empathy for him. I'm very close to his mother. Yeah. Uh, you know, look, my, my issue is that, that the WikiLeaks party is separate and a lot of people are trying to conflate that. And then there's something else that I really think is very important that we've been discussing uh, internally within our campaign community. And that is the moment that you elevate somebody as the figurehead to a point where they are untouchable, where you can't criticise them, yeah. where you can't have open conversation about behaviour without being absolutely decimated and smeared, you know, by other supporters, then you are disempowering the movement. You are disempowering the very values uh, that Julian has been fighting for. And I don't think we do Julian any service to put him in that position and 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 elevate him to you know this godlike status. He's a human being. He's a man. He's a flawed individual. He's also a genius and, a, and an extraordinarily courageous human being. Uh, but I'm not going to blow smoke up his ass. Mm. You know, yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, the movement really needs to consider that because, you know, our point has always been that what happens to Julian Assange as an Australian citizen is what could potentially happen to any one of us. Yeah. He is the canary in the coal mine, and we need to honour that and protect him and reflect that. Uh, but there is something that has gone on in this movement where the focus has been drawn away from the fact that while Julian remains under house arrest, or, or sorry, while he remains in the Ecuadorian embassy now with uh, political asylum but unable to leave, 
while he's there and he's safe at the moment, we are all still threatened by the legislation and the behaviour of rogue states and and players. And, and we need to refocus our attention and really work out how do we best serve the work of WikiLeaks and Julian. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more there. Look, uh, is there anything we haven't asked about that you'd like to, to mention or any other suggestions for people who want to be more involved? Look, you know, uh, I would really like to uh, recommend that uh, we've been under attack for four weeks uh, over our our departure from the WikiLeaks party. Yeah. And w what I would just really like to say to people is to, to seriously consider that, you know, we, we've we dedicated three years of our lives to, to supporting Julian to help build the movement that enabled the party to occur. And you don't walk away from something that you love uh, easily. So rather than perhaps attacking us as somehow being uh, agent provocateurs or saboteurs, uh, perhaps people should focus their attention on asking why the WikiLeaks party has refused to conduct an independent review. Uh, now, they're saying there's an internal review taking place, and I can tell you right now that none of the council members that resigned have been contacted. And, and that's, you know, golden rule number one in terms of a review. You must speak to all stakeholders. Yeah. So there is something going on here, and I believe that the WikiLeaks party in its current state is something that anyone around the world looking to replicate it should look very, very seriously at, at what's gone on here so that it doesn't occur in some other manifestation of, of this party. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough one. Any chance of you guys uh, that have resigned rejoining the WikiLeaks political party and getting back involved in the future to uh, try and influence some changes? Well... Look, uh, you know, never say never, but yep. but but in its current form, uh, and there are certain uh, elements uh, working within that party that uh, will clearly continue to behave uh, in a subversive way. Uh, the party needs a complete clean out, restructure. The constitution needs to be altered uh, to truly either reflect a democratic party or to go the whole hog and make it uh, an autocratic party run by Julian and his father. And if that's if that's the intention of the party, uh, then I certainly, for one, would not be participating as a grassroots, uh, democratic, transparent activist in an autocratic uh, party. So I guess that's up to the current people that are, are still involved and to the members to really pressure and decide what kind of new political body they, they want and how they want to participate. You know, if, if you want to keep... Uh, creating the same old paradigm just changing the face then maybe that's not problematic for you uh, but if you're seriously interested in cracking open this duopoly uh, then you have to look at at, at participation and, and democratic value yeah for sure true words yeah. look uh, thanks so much for joining us today and sharing your experiences and insights sam it's always good to have you on the show uh, i would like to encourage listeners in Australia to try to hear Alexa and whistleblower at the Whistleblower Forum in Sydney on the, the 16th uh, or Melbourne on the Friday the 20th of this month. You can find information by following Sam on Twitter, aka Wacker, uh, or go to the Wacker site, wacker.net.au, solidarity uh, forward slash Alexa dash O'Brien. Uh, we usually like to close with an inspir inspirational thought, and we uh, have taken this one from your WikiLeaks party resignation, quoting Julian Assange. It is time to take up the arms of our new world or uh, to fight for ourselves and for those we love. Our task is to secure self-determination where we can, to hold back the coming dystopia where we cannot, and if all else fails, to accelerate its self-destruction. Uh, Julian Assange, London, October 2012. Thanks again, Sam. We'd love to have you back again uh, and uh, keep us informed of what's going on. Eh? Thanks, Lorax. Talk soon. Talk soon. Thanks. Bye.